was 30 seconds. Now you can speak to your partners. Fair. Now the share part is normally if you want to say something out loud. We can do that in the moment in a moment, but I want to show you another little tool which is a great thing. This is like this is like Twitter, but it's safe Twitter. Completely safe and secure and private. Uh, it's called Today's Meet. Now, if you either put the address into your phone or uh, use the uh, the QR code, it will take you to a chat room that I created the other day. And the great thing about this chat room is that nobody knows it exists unless I give them the link. And you have the same limit of 140 characters as you have in Twitter. You don't need to register or anything like this. You just put in a username for that chat. And you can write your 140 characters. And... The great thing is, is that the teacher can also download the transcript so you get the whole conversation. So it's a really nice way of, uh, of having kind of brief interventions from students. And it may be even, you know, is good for those who perhaps don't want to put up their hand and say something out loud in class, but they can still intervene. And again, this is just like Padlet. It's something you might be able to take advantage of in the classroom, but you can also take advantage of outside the classroom for them to communicate. Now, when I create the chat room, it can, I, I have options for how long it lasts. I think the minimum is two hours and the maximum is one year. So I can make it last for any time. So it can be for a single activity, it can be for a single semester, it can be for one week, it can be for whatever you want it for. No? And there's kind of the, the many, many possibilities. So if you're in or somebody from your group is in,
Okay, but thank you very much. I'm glad you find it interesting. I'm glad life is wonderful for you. But the idea was to answer the question, what things can the students and the teachers do in class that they can't do outside the class? Your relevant responses, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, good. Um, I, I'm trying to get you to convince yourselves of this now, and what I'm seeing on here in the conversation is most of you are saying things about interaction, about the social element of learning, um, and about communicative skills, and about speaking, and about all of these all of, the, all of these things, right? Now, of course, you, you, it, children can spend time reading at home, but we might want to spend time in class teaching them reading strategies, for example. But that doesn't mean to say that the whole time has to be spent reading in class, no? So we can kind of optimize this, this time. So it, classes shouldn't just be conversation classes. It can't just be speaking, no? But I think when we start thinking about these things, is this something that they need me in order to do or not? And if they do, do it in class. And if they don't, give it for homework. Because what often happens in traditional classrooms is you explain stuff in class, you don't know whether they understood it or not, you give them homework, they go home, they don't understand what they have to do, and they're doing the task where they need the expert help alone, or with the help of a non-expert, the parent. Yeah? And it kind of makes you think, hmm, shouldn't it be the other way around? No? That imagine that they had the explanation at home, and in class, they did the homework, and me, the teacher, is there to help. That, that seems to make a lot of, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how convincing you find it, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm trying to, as I say. Now, the 
the same question. How was it for you? What did you th this question is specifically related to the Today's Meet tool. What did you think about this? Today's Meet, what do you think? Talk to your partners, 30 seconds, go. Okay, so. I imagine. See, it really. See, it really does work. I tried the traditional method, which was speaking louder than you, and it didn't work. So, um, so I mean, some of you at the beginning were writing, how interesting and nice and things like this. No, so I've. I suppose positive. Any other thoughts about this tool or any other thoughts about what you might use it for? The other great thing about it is it, it, it has this character limit of 140 characters. This is like, we can work on literacy with things like this. No, yeah, I, I don't know if you've heard about projects like rewriting books and you have 140 characters for each chapter, no? like El Quixote no? in, in tweets, no? with 140 characters for each, for each chapter, this kind of thing. Now, this is what literature is all about, right? Now, poetry and things like this, imposing limits and having to be creative within those limits. No? So there are lots of things. But the thing about this is, the great thing is, is that on the page you can have the whole tape script so you can monitor the whole conversation as well. No? So for error correction, for responding to things like this, it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's great. Now, this is what I was saying before about what happens in traditional and flipped classrooms. Take a look. Do you know where flip learning originated from? One of the originators was, uh, I forget his first name. His, his surname is Khan. We'll call him Mr. Khan, K-H-A-N. And um, he was um, a stockbroker on Wall Street. And he had two cousins, uh, younger cousins, much younger than him, that were studying uh, calculus. And they weren't very good at it. And they said, uncle, can you give us some help? But unfortunately, he lived thousands of miles away. So he started creating video explanations of calculus and sending, it, sending them to his cousins. And they learned calculus in, in this way. Right? Um, and then he started uploading these videos to YouTube so that anybody could see them. And then people started getting in touch with him through YouTube and said, ah, could you explain this? Could you explain that? And so on. And then finally, he founded the, the Khan Academy, which is kind of a big kind of flip learning type platform uh, where you have this blended learning model no, of uh, video explanations. And, and this, is the way that you, this is the way that you learn. So um, this, is, this is kind of where it comes from. And this is the model. And it, it, and it, demo, you know, it demonstrates that you, that you can learn in this way, certainly. Um, so. It does tend to involve technology, which some people are a bit scared of. Um, it doesn't have to. I think part of the idea is that, and I love the idea of changing the concept of homework. Because homework is something that they do a posteriori, no? after the event. 
And my idea of homework, or a nice idea of homework, is why is it not something that they do in advance of the class? No? Something that they do to prepare for the lesson, so that they come already having had that input, and then it's the teacher's expertise in the classroom and knowledge of the subject and knowledge of how to teach that is exploited in the, in the classroom. So, um, you know, it's, I'm not against giving homework, certainly, but the type of homework and the purpose of the homework can, uh, can change. Now, um, I want you to do another, this, six statements here. And I want you to decide to what degree you are in agreement with these statements or not. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you two options. You can do it in the traditional way. You can do it with pen and paper by talking to the people that are next to you. Or, surprise, surprise, you can do it in the technological way. Okay? Now, the good thing about the technological way, this is a Google form. It's like a Google quiz. If you answer the questions on here, I get the responses. I get the responses in, my, in, a, in a spreadsheet, like an Excel sheet. And I also get graphs that I can show you. So if you go on here, you have the six questions. All you have to do is to press one of the numbers for each of the questions. And then I will get the responses. And we can see the general tendency to those questions. So let's have a look.
If you want your vote to be counted, you have 30 seconds. No pressure. 29, 28, 27, 26. You got 30 seconds. Keep going. Okay, you're very quiet, so I assume you're finished. Good. So, look, because um, this is a Google, a Google Docs, Google Forms, it it sends the results. It sends the results to a a, a Google spreadsheet right and here if I want I have a summary of the answers so now we have something to discuss digital technologies will replace face-to-face -face teaching we know which the most popular number is Okay, so what do, you, what, what do you have to say? What do you think? Why? Somebody wrote two. Why? Justify your answer. Thank you. Yeah, technology doesn't teach, no? Teachers can use technology to teach, no? To help students to learn, but the teacher's not going to... Who, who creates the materials if it's not a, not a teacher, no? Or not someone with a teaching background. But somebody wrote four... Uh, some people wrote four. Is anybody brave enough to put up their hand and justify their answer? And, and I'd be very interested to hear it. Good. And then, okay, so we'll go in this order. Thanks. Or ladies, ladies before gentlemen, let's. Absolutely, it supplements or replaces in some contexts. Yeah, sure. I love that. I love that. What, just, teachers can do something different from teaching. I always ask my students, particularly when they're in like the second year or something like this, because they're, they're, they just say obvious answers. No? I say, so what's a teacher's job? And they all say, to teach. And I say, uh-uh, wrong. And they look very confused. And I say, no, the teacher's job is to get their students to learn. That doesn't necessarily mean direct instruction from the front of the class with your explanation, right? So teachers can do things other than what we traditionally think of as teaching, right? I Of course, the teacher's role is very, very wide. Yeah? I am thinking more about the didactic things here, though. So you're absolutely right, of course. Many, many other functions. But I, I think what we're thinking about is the role of a teacher in their didactic function, maybe. You know, that role can change, perhaps.
Of course, yeah. Okay. Digital technology will replace teachers. I'm very glad that you all saw it. Well, let's, let's hope it's a one. No? Otherwise, we could be in some trouble. Um, so that's, yeah, cause for optimism. Digital technologies aren't designed for education. Hmm. Anything to say about this? Kids are easy to trick, right? <laughs> yeah, they get excited about doing the same thing, but just using the computer, yeah. It's I think that's the key point. Uh, lots of these things are designed for other purposes, but can be repurposed for education. Even the augmented reality, for example, you know, this was for marketing and sales, you know, so that pe people could have the idea of having the object in their, in their hand, right? It wasn't designed for education, but as teachers, we find it very easy. I think we're very, we have a natural um, feeling for adapting these things towards education, no? even if they're not designed for that. So that's a very, that's a very positive thing. No, why not, why not take advantage of them? Um, digital technologies fail and cause delays. Okay. But is this a new thing? I remember years ago, the cassette. No? The cassette spent a lot of time just being a mass on the floor, no? And just not... Um, have you ever worked in a classroom where they still have... Um, la pizarra con tiza, no? The chalk and so yeah, yeah. And you can't find a piece of chalk. Yeah? So it's not like, it's not like this is an argument for not using technology, no? I, I would, but it might not work. And if it doesn't work, I don't know what to do. Well, that's always been the case, however limited the technology is, I think, no? So uh, perhaps this is not a good reason. It's good to have a plan B. Um, of course. Students know more about digital technology than teachers. Hmm. No extremes here. What I want to say, I've thought about this a lot.
That was a very good idea. Would you mind saying it into the microphone? Okay. Well, the idea, and I, I agree 100% with this. Teachers always say, oh, the kids know more than we do. And I think, no, they don't. They don't. They really don't. They know or they, they very quickly learn how something works, so seem very proficient in a very short amount of time. But they don't know about the ethics, about the responsible use, uh, when and where and why and how to use them, etc. They, they, they just know the, the very quickly the, the functioning of it. Um, so the other thing is, I think, they know how to do certain things. The same is true with all to, whether, you're interested, whether you're interested in new technologies or not, you all know how to use some of them pretty well, I think. And others, no idea. But then the person sitting next to you probably knows how to use those, but not as well the ones that you've used. And this is always changing. I mean, I, I don't know if, I remember we had a, a seminar at the university from the IT department, <coughs> excuse me, on how to edit videos using Movie Maker. It's a really simple thing to do. And some of the teachers there were like, wow, well, I already know how to do this. And, that. and the IT guys had the latest version at the time, was like Movie Maker 8 or something like this. And the teachers were like, because they'd learned Movie Maker 7 and it looked a bit different. No? So suddenly they were completely lost. No? Um, so it doesn't matter how much you know about a certain technology or something, it's going to adapt and change very quickly anyway. So it's these transferable skills about knowing how to use it responsibly and, use it and things like this, which we can teach them. Because they're not going to be up to date for very long. They have to constantly renew, the same as we do, right? So again, um, I, I kind of disagree with this statement, uh, which is good news for us, I think. I don't know if I'm convincing you, but I'm convinced. Um, and the last one, <clears throat> taking into account what I just said, would you still think that four or five is really the place here, that you don't get enough training? Uh, do you need it? If you get it, what happens next year when things have changed? <clears throat> So this is, my, this is my model, this is my idea for this, and it's the cascade effect, no? Learn how to use one thing for a, your purposes, for something which is very good for you. If you like it, get enthusiastic about it and try to sell the idea to your colleagues and encourage them to do the same thing. Because I know how to use some stuff and my colleagues know how to use other stuff. And they say, Matthew, you have to try this. It's great. You can do. And I'll go, wow, show me how to do this. And they show me. And then I incorporate it too. And then another day I'll say, do you know the program or the app? They'll go, no. Oh, you have to try it. It's not. And this is the way to go, really, I think. Because training becomes very obsolete in technology very quickly, I think. So, again, this is good news. Think. And this is a this is another big idea. This is another big idea. Flip learning is not only about incorporating more technology. It's a definite pedagogical shift. It's about optimizing and maximizing the time in class and rationalizing and justifying what we do in class and why we do it in class and what we can do outside class and why we can do that outside class. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a big change. It's a lot more than making videos or doing technology. Now, a <clears throat> little bit of theory, a little bit, but with a practical example. I don't know if any of you have seen this before. This is the SAMA model of technology use, and it's related to why we might incorporate technology. And the further you go up, the more justification there is. So substitution. 
Um, I am not a fan of digital la pizarras digitales, digital whiteboards. I'm not a fan. Because I see so many teachers do things on there which is just the same as they would do on the traditional whiteboard. Or they project the book. And the argument for the teachers is, oh, but the kids love it because it's colorful and it's bright. and it's, uh, But this produces diminishing returns, I think. Very quickly, it becomes normal. <clears throat> so if we're, all we're doing is using the technology to do something that we did anyway, then it's very difficult to justify this, I think. So let's take writing, for example. So um, I remember a few years ago, I, I thought, and, and somebody mentioned this before, and it's certainly initially more attractive. But if you ask students, to, I used to get students to write their composition to give it to me. Then I thought, aha, they can do it on computer and send it to me by email. And initially, it was more attractive. But then I thought, like, it's really, it is just the same thing. Huh? However, if we can add something to this, so if we can teach them how to, use the, how to use Word in a more effective way, then we've augmented this process a little bit. I had a, a funny situation with a group of my students recently, and they, they wrote very badly, and they, I gave lots of zeros for their work because they gave them to me in Word, and some of the things, many things were underlined in red, and other things were underlined in green. No? And I asked them, what that meant. And they said, someone said, the red means it's, it's bad. I said, exactly. It means that there's a spelling mistake or something and it doesn't exist. So when you see red, why do you still give me this piece of work? Word is telling you that it's bad and you're ignoring this help. There's no excuse. Zero. And I said, what does it mean when it's green? And somebody said, that means it's good. And I said, mm, unfortunately not. How would the computer know that they like what you write? No? Um, and I said, so, so I said, in some cases, some of you, obviously, you think that Word loves your writing because almost everything is underlined in green. No? So if we teach them to use this, this, these kind of tools, then we're, we're certainly making some kind of improvement. However, when you get above the dotted line, we get to modification. And modification means changing the nature of the task or the nature of the product. And that becomes then a more powerful imperative for using the technology, for doing something that was difficult before. So, for example, um, I really love doing uh, peer, uh, peer feedback. So they write it, they send it to their partner. Their partner can use their control cambios tool and can insert uh, some comments and things like this, and then they receive it and they they write a second version. This is something that would be more difficult to do with pen and paper. No, it's certainly modified the task. And right at the top is redefining. Now, the Google Docs that we just did, okay, this was a, this was a form, this was a questionnaire, but in Google Docs, you can have people simultaneously working on a document. And that makes writing collaborative. And writing's never been collaborative. It's always been an individual pursuit. So using technology can redefine the task. And in that case, I think there's a very strong argument for trying to use it. So redefining the type of task we do rather than just, uh, just substituting. Now, I want to show you some tools. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these. Um, <clears throat> and there are maybe hundreds that do the same thing. Um, EduCreations and Vittel uh, convert your tablet into a, a digital whiteboard and records your voice. So you can write on the board, you can pause and add images and put things from the internet and so on. It makes it very, very easy to create instructional videos with your voice using your tablet. Uh, I've seen lots of maths teachers use this, now explaining how they solve maths problems and, and things like this, right? So this is a, is a great tool. Again, wasn't designed for education, but we as teachers think about ways that we can um, adapt things for education. Padlet we saw before. Um, Edmodo is like Facebook, but it's, you're probably aware of this now, but it's designed for education. So again, it's a safe kind of educational version of, uh, of Facebook. 
And, and Jing is my absolute favorite, okay? Because it's the quickest. Uh, have any of you seen it before? It's the quickest and it's the easiest and it's absolutely great. So let's have a, let's have a quick look at this. Basically, what I can do is click on here, select an area of the screen, press record. So this is the questionnaire that we did today, and here we have the answers to the different questions. So uh, in the first one, it seems that the most popular answer was number two, in the second one the most popular answer was number one, in the third one number one, in the fourth one number four, in the fifth one number three, and in the final one number four. Okay, now, finish, and Okay, now, if I want to share this video, the video doesn't exist physically, really. It's in the cloud. So, okay, we're on quite slow Wi-Fi here. But this bar would normally go up quite quickly. <clears throat> and when it gets to the top, in your right click, you have the link to the video. You can send the video, post the vi uh, send the link, or uh, via email, or, or put the link on your school website, or send it via Padlet, or whatever you want to do. And then whoever clicks on there will see this video. Um, and it has so many possible functions. It takes the teaching outside of the classroom. You can make free videos of up to five minutes. Um, you can get your students to use this as well. I had um, I, I taught a group of university teachers a few years ago, teaching them English. And I used this to give them feedback on their written work. Because giving written feedback... But I can give spoken feedback in two minutes with their work on the screen, which is much more detailed than, the, than I would be willing to write. Um, and I did this with this group of students. And one of the students was a, a teacher of nursing, and his eyes lit up, and he said, great, I can use this with my students, because one of the tasks that he wanted them to do was to interpret uh, x-ray images no? of chests, broken bones, and things like this. And he said that uh, what he was going to do with them was send them the images of the x-rays, and what they'd have to do on their computer is put this on the screen, and create the little video with the commentary and so on, send it back to him, and this was part of their assessment, no part of their evaluation. So really, when you think that you can make a quick and simple video which occupies no space on your computer just by selecting the screen and adding your voice, then I think this becomes a very powerful tool. It's a, a screen casting tool, right? Um, it's better if you have good Wi-Fi. For example, okay, you can't hear this very well, but this is uh, a portfolio of activities from one of my students. And what I did in advance was highlighted some things that were interesting. Then I created the video, uh, sent the video back to her. You can see me 
in a moment scrolling through her work, making some comments. I can even work on the document in real time and highlight things and so on. So um, it's a great way for giving input, but also a fantastic way for giving, uh, for giving feedback. Now, and we're going to cancel this because it wasn't the most interesting of videos anyway. And I'm not sure if you're aware of these. When I, was revising, when I was revising this presentation yesterday, I had a big disappointment. I don't know if you know about Present Me, but Present Me is an online tool which allows you to upload a PowerPoint presentation and to add your voice, and if you want or not, to also add your webcam image. So it's great for giving presentations and for giving input. And when I was checking this yesterday and checking the link, it said, sorry, we are disappearing. Um, however, however, on the, on the message it said, we advise you to check out Office Mix. And Office Mix is something that I'd already started using anyway. Uh, are any of you aware of it? <clears throat> it's a free plugin for PowerPoint. If you have a if you have a pirated version, then sorry. If you have an original version that you've paid for and a license and so on, you can get this free plugin, and it's a video suite which allows you to record videos of your PowerPoint presentations. And you can pause. You can, you can actually draw on the presentations and highlight them and so on, and it records this on the video but doesn't record it on the original presentation. Or, or if you want it to, you can so that you have two versions. And it means that you can make um, videos of your, of your presentations. Um, like I said, it's free. It's an excellent tool. I'm going to show you, see if we get lucky. So this is, um, I, I teach um, blended learning semi-presencial courses as well. Uh, and I see my students three times, three Saturdays. Uh, and everything else is online. And I teach the same subject that I teach presencial. And sometimes it's very, like it's a bit of a shame for me that I don't get to see them so much. So some of the classes that I give, if I have the presentation made, I create a video using present me before and now using Office Mix. And what it means is that they can't escape from me. They even have to watch me at home. Volume's not very good in here. So what they get essentially is a class. They kind of don't really need to come to class. They get the activities sent to them. They do, when they do come to class, this is the thing. I have three Saturdays with a group per subject, and I get an hour and 50 minutes with them, so a little bit less than this session today. Now, I don't really know these students. Um, I might have 25 in a group, and I meet them three times. Um, attendance is not 
mandatory. They can decide to come to the class or not, which puts me in a very difficult situation, or all of the teachers really, because we are not allowed to do anything which is essential for the subject, because assistance, uh, sorry, attendance is not obligatory. But we have to do something useful and interesting for them to try and motivate them to come. It's pretty tricky, right? This is why this flipped model is particularly good in this case, because they get all of the input outside class, and what I do inside the classroom is resolve doubts, extend them, discuss these things, etc., etc., and all the work they've done in preparation for, for the class. <clears throat> what are the challenges of this? Well, it means that I go into class. I have some things prepared, but I don't really know what's going to happen. No? Uh, and it also means that I definitely can't have everybody doing the same thing at the same time. Because maybe these three over here, maybe these three just really didn't understand any of my explanation whatsoever. So I have to, and the others, they did, and they're interested in something else, so I have to try and find some way to extend them. However, although this feels like a lot of work, if you have a control and a command of the subject, it's much more, more fulfilling, much more enjoyable, because you really think that you're responding to their needs, and everybody gets to the same place in the end, but it's not the lockstep marching approach, right? It's everybody kind of going at their, at their own rhythm. So the other thing is, Time. Teachers always complain about time. We never have enough time. However, if we see this as an investment, then it changes its neck. Because some of these videos I made five years ago haven't taught that class since. I send them to the video, and we do different things in class. So, um, you know, contents, the law changes. Contents like what used to be unit three is now unit five, but the, cha the contents don't change that much. No? So producing these things, I think, is a, is a very worthwhile, a very worthwhile investment. So, some of the ideas, some of the things that we can do with these tools. A lot of the stuff that we do anyway, but often takes up a lot of time. Another situation I come across quite often is teachers saying they don't have enough time in class have to finish the book, don't have enough time. But I observe a lot of teachers teaching, and I see a lot of valuable time wasted doing things that, for example, correcting homework. No? Correcting homework. I gave you 10 questions for homework. Okay. So, Jaime, question number one. Come to the front. Write the answer on the board. No? Jaime, thank you very much. Good. Sit down. Maria, question number two. Go and, and we get 50 minutes of correcting 10 questions for which were homework, right? Um, by using these tools, we can give them the answers. I, I'm always in favor of projecting the answers, giving them the answers, and if they got any wrong, they tell you. And it turns out that everybody got number eight wrong. So what do we spend time on? Question number eight. No, we don't spend time on question number one, two, three, four, and five. And six and seven that everybody got correct. No? Um, so I think it is the, the, one of the big messages from, the, from today, I hope, is about, um, is about maximizing time, no? optimizing the time. Um, another big idea. Um, pro. Pro is a very nice word. Pro is a very positive thing. No? Consumers. Um, yeah, the internet used to be about consuming content, no? but then we got Web 2.0, and it's about producing content as well. The thing is, with all of these tools that we can use for ourselves, these screencasting tools, Office Mix, Jing, 
things like this, is that if we get our students to use them as well. Um, and some of these, I mean, they can use them not only for just producing these things, but for collaborating as well. Today's Meet, Padlet, um, the Google Docs and things like this, these are all things that we can get the students to use and they can collaborate and cooperate in, in real time, right? <clears throat> um, couple more things and then I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna get past the, the section of me showing you some tools. The thing is with the tools though, is that these are just examples and there are many other tools that can do the same thing. Teachers sometimes say to me things like, Matthew, how can I use Twitter in class? I want to use Twitter. And I say, why? Silence. The, the technology is not the objective. I ask them, wait a minute, what's the activity? What do you want to do? Because maybe Twitter's not the best thing for doing it. Maybe there's something else that could accomplish the same objective. And teachers sometimes think that, or people sometimes think that the the technology itself is the, is the objective, and it certainly isn't. Have any of you ever used a wiki? Let's see if I can open this one. Okay, so I had a... I had a wiki with a, group of, uh, with a group of students. I've done this several times. Wiki's really easy. Wiki is, a, is a, a website that you can edit. So on any of these pages, if you click on edit, it transforms to something like a Word document. So you can add images, you can write, you can do whatever. And when you click save, it transforms back into a, a web page again. Now one of the things I, I did here is this, this is a group of students uh, yeah, it's just a step and, and we did a, a little psychological test. I went into class and I said, okay, draw a tree. Everybody, take a piece of paper and draw a tree. Do you know the tree test? It's quite common psychological test, right? So they, they didn't know what I was doing this for. So I said, draw a tree. So everybody drew a tree. I said, okay, show, show your trees. Some of them were very artistic, some of them not quite so much. And I said, okay, the tree says a lot about your personality. Your homework is to go home, get on the internet, and discover what your tree says about you. Then what you have to do is upload your picture. Take a photo or scan, upload it onto the, onto the wiki, and I'd like you to write underneath what you've discovered about your psychological profile and what the tree says about you. So this is kind of student-generated content. Like, I didn't explain this to them. I gave them the medium, and, and we had some really interesting ones. Look at this one, it's very nice. See, they are here, she has, she has some apples in her tree, and she has some roots in her tree, which says a lot about her. This tree has no ground, it's just suspended in midair. This says something about her as well. All of these trees I think some of the trees say something about their artistic capabilities as well. This would be my limit of drawing a tree, I think, this one. And my favorite one, this is my favorite tree. Clearly, he is obsessed with something. <clears throat> so, um, the wiki is a great thing, but it could be a blog. There are other things that you could use as well, but it's editable content generated by your students, and it's a great way of communicating with them. Uh, Another strong reason for doing this. Do you know what the, 21st, what the 21st century skills are? Well, first of all, do you know what the four C's of CLIL are? And I really hope you know this by now. They are? In any particular order?
content, cognition, communication, and culture, right? Now, curiously, 21st century skills have also been divided into a framework of four C's. Do you know what they are? Let's have a look. Very clever. It's easy when you know the answer. <laughs> and the thing is that these kind of coincide with CLIL. Anyway, communication is a big one, of course. Um, creativity and critical thinking, really, these are elements, high elements of cognition. Uh, and collaboration, well, you know, this is slightly different maybe, no? but, um, but the, you can see the similarities here. Do you know about Bloom's taxonomy? You've had this, right? So this is what I showed you before. Um, this was the, the SAMA model. And the higher up we go, the easier it is to justify the use of the technology. And I think this matches quite nicely with Bloom's taxonomy as well. So the higher we go, when you start re redefining tasks, they tend to be more evaluative and more creative. Um, so there's a strong imperative here for incorporating technology into our lessons when it's at a level of modifying and redefining and when it involves analyzing, evaluating, and creating rather than the lower order thinking skills. Now, I want to do a little, I want to do a little test with you because I'm just curious. Because I said, do you know about Bloom's taxonomy? And people go, yeah. You know about cognition? Yeah. So, here's a little test for you. Uh, do you remember the levels at the bottom? Ah, not, no, the pyramids, not the other one. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Remembering. You might want to write them down, maybe. Remembering, understanding, applying, these are lots. Analyzing, evaluating, creating, these are hots. Now, what I'd like you to do very quickly with your partners is, I've got five questions here, and I want you to decide with your partners on which level each of these questions might be working. Good luck. So, I could, I could correct the answers and get one person to come to the front and do number one and another person, but that would be, that would, we haven't got that much time, so. There you go. Now I'm sure, because this is not the first time I've done this, I'm sure that some of you thought some of those questions were much higher order than they really are. Like, for example, the first one. Can you give me an example? I don't know why. Teachers think this is a high, tend to think this is a higher order thinking question. But really, it's just understanding. Let give me give you a little, uh, a little example. Can you give me an example of an amphibian? Good. 
Okay. See? Now, if you can give me an example, I know you understand the concept of amphibian, right? Good. Now, can you give me 10 examples of an amphibian? Is that harder? Is that higher level thinking? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. What I just did is I made low level thinking more difficult, but I didn't make it high level thinking. Because if you give me one example, that's easy because we all know a frog. But if I ask for five or ten, cognitively we're working at exactly the same level. I just changed the conditions and made low level thinking harder. Can you give me a definition of an amphibian? Anyone feeling brave? Definition of an amphibian. Last time I did this, there were some secondary school teachers and I had a biology teacher. Her, her, her explanation just blew me away, really. Um, can you give me a definition of an amphibian? Okay, so it's an animal that can breathe under the water and also on land, right? Very good. What level of thinking is that? Could be remembering if you read that definition and committed it to memory, or it could be understanding. But do you notice what happens here? It's on the same level as can you give me an example. How did I make it more difficult? I made it linguistically more challenging. Because giving a definition is more difficult and also we need relative clauses. It's an animal which can live. That's a relative clause, quite complex language. But the level of thinking is very low. Linguistically, it's more difficult than saying frog. But cognitively, it's no more difficult, really. Now, really high-level thinking would be, how would you test if an animal is an amphibian? Silence. Nobody's saying frog here. It's a rhetorical question. It, it is a rhetorical question, yeah. How would you take now if I asked you this question, how would you and you had to design a test to discover if an animal is an amphibian or not? If you could do that, then you'd really understand amphibians at a much higher or deeper level, depending on how we're thinking about it, right? Now one thing you could do is you could hold it underwater. Uh, for three minutes. And when you bring it up, if it's alive, it's an amphibian. If it's not, it wasn't. Like, cat, amphibian or not? Huh? Could be, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, the thing is, is when we move to a more flipped model, the lower level thinking stuff, which is the understanding and the remembering, can be done with these screen casting tools or the reading that you ask them to do or the things that you ask them to do outside class. And all of the stuff which challenges them and extends them, because you've laid the foundation outside the class, can be done inside the class. Now, I know some of you will be thinking, yeah, but what if they don't do it at home? Okay. Not ideal, but also not a problem that we cannot overcome. Some students come to class having done and understood everything we asked of them. Some of them come to class having done, kind of understood. Some of them come to class having done and understood nothing. And some of them come to class not having done. But therefore we can change the grouping, we can change the activities and we can do the things which respond more to their, to their needs, right? So this is very, um, this is very connected to um, a justification for flip learning. Now, <clears throat> what I was going to get you to do, but we're running out of time, is uh, to create a Google form. Now, the Google form is what we did before with the questionnaire about digital technology. Have any of you ever created one or used one? For those of you who haven't, I'll just show you very, very briefly, because I think it's a great thing.
So I'm in my Google Drive here. Google Drive, of course, is free. The other thing is, this is not the only tool for doing this. You have Quizlet, you have lots of other tools that you can do for creating this kind of thing. But if I go on New, and then I go down to More, and then I go down to Google, it's okay, it's gonna last 12, 12 percent, got loads of time. So new, more, Google Forms. And here I can create different types of questions. They can be multiple choice, they can be on a scale like the one that I asked you to do. You can ask them to write short answers, they can be yes or no, etc., etc. And again, when you want to share this, you send it and it arrives uh, as a link to whoever you send it to. Now, it's a great thing for teachers to use, but it's an amazing thing to get students to use as well. There's something very powerful about students assessing other students. Let's take a topic, for example, I don't know, photosynthesis, for example. And imagine I have, this is my class, and I have this group over here. And I ask them to create a Google Forms exam, test, questionnaire, whatever you want to call it, to create it and to send the link to them. And then I ask them to create one with 10 questions and to send the link to them, and so on, successively. No? And then finally, what we get is a load of student-created exams. Now. The student's criteria for creating those exams, what are they going to do? First of all, they're going to think, what's important? What's necessary? What was difficult for me? What do I know about this? What am I going to ask the other people? Okay? And also, they're probably going to want to make their exam difficult. Okay? And what will happen here is that not everybody will get all of the questions correct, but that doesn't matter. This is formative assessment. This is the teacher identifying what the students know and don't know, what they think is important, what they don't think is important, and so on. And it's student-generated content. Now, that's one idea of one use for this technology. And again, it's taking learning a little bit outside the classroom and changing what we do. Because imagine the homework is you're going to receive a little test, a little questionnaire from your classmate. I want you to answer it, and in the next class, we're going to go through the answers. You saw what I did with the graph. You could see what the responses were. You could see, you have a wealth of information here, and this is really flipping the classroom on its head, because what you're doing in class is guiding, correcting, extending, all of these things, right? So... And now I'm going to finish. You were a bit late coming back, so you do kind of owe me 10 minutes. Just saying. So, this is uh, kind of to, to summarize. By flipping the classroom and doing this kind of thing and using these kind of tools, if we do it well, we're doing this. Another big idea was this one, that content doesn't have to come from the teacher necessarily. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, teacher generated or chosen by the teacher. Now it can come from the students as well. And this very much modifies the role of the teacher in the classroom, I think. And finally, and I'm going to be a little bit cheeky here. Thank you very much. This book uh, would be a welcome addition to your school, I think. It's called Planning for Clil. It's in Spanish. Even though the title is in English, uh, there's a, a, a whole kind of theoretical framework and background on how to do CLIL. 
the things to take into consideration and how to do it. Uh, there are also some uh, sections in there which are in English, which are reflection tasks or tasks that you might be able to do with your colleagues, with yourself to reflect on how you're, how you're teaching and how you're applying CLIL or how you're trying to apply CLIL in your, in your classrooms. And at the end of the book, the final unit is a didactic unit, which is in English as well. And it puts into practice all of these principles and all of these ideas that are explained in the rest of the book. It's about 110 pages. It's only a, a thin thing, no? Um, so I think it's something that you might be interested in. Don't worry. I'm not going to... Somebody's going to... Somebody might make some money out of this, but it won't be me. Um, so it's, I, I really believe in it. I think it would be a nice, uh, it'd be a nice addition to your school's library, perhaps, and it could be very helpful for you. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. You've been very nice. You've been very participative. And uh, I hope I've convinced you of the idea that we can partially flip the classroom. Of course, any methodology, if taken to its extreme, becomes a bit ridiculous. But there are elements here which hopefully you can incorporate, which will mean that you do in class stuff which is more personalized for your group of students and stuff that you enjoy doing a bit more and that they enjoy doing a bit more. Uh, and, and, you know, this can be a very productive experience. So uh, I hope... Some of this was convincing because I believe it. Thank you.